So we had a couple of keynotes now and uh, we, we're going to have uh, a, a slight change. We're going to have a, a panel instead of another keynote and then we're going to break for lunch. So it's going to be a very interesting panel and uh, in the morning when uh, Mr. Bapu and Mr. Sham presented their notes from yesterday's roundtable, a few of you approached us asking if you could be a part of it. So I think now is that time. Uh, so we, got, we have a couple of uh, experienced folk uh, who have been uh, leaders, design leaders in their uh, companies. So firstly, uh, I would like to uh, introduce the moderator who will uh, subsequently introduce uh, the other panelist. So Shilpi has over 15 years of experience as a designer, strategist, user, ex user researcher and educator. Currently, she's the founder of Coach Labs, an innovative consultancy where the mission is to help business leaders of organizations discover new opportunities for growth and optimize the process to implement new ideas. Can I please have you on stage, Shilpi Kumar? While the panelists arrive, um, let me give... I'm really excited today with the panel that we have. Uh, out of the panels, I decided, uh, and Kaladar helped me, pick two non-designers and, and the rest designers intentionally. And the amazing thing is that they are design leaders in their own different contexts. So we have um, Rebecca Rubens, who's the founder of Rhizome, which is India's first multidisciplinary sustainability design studio, working at the intersection of craft, design, and sustainability. She's also an author of two books, uh, Bamboo from Green Design to Sustainability Design, and then Holistic Sustainability through Craft Design Collaborations. Um, then we have Anand. Um, he started a company 10 years ago called Graminer. Um, Anand is a design, uh, data science, scientist, he calls himself. And uh, design plays a very important role in his organization. Uh, he's uh, recognized as one of India's top data scientists. He leads a team who tells beautiful visual data stories. You might have seen his uh, booth in the last two days and learn more about his organization. He's also a gold medalist from IIM Bangalore, an alumnus of IIT Madras, London School of Business, uh, IBM, Infosys, Lehman Brothers, and BCG. So thanks for being part of the panel. Um, then we have uh, Troy uh, Asmoon. He's a uh, founder of the design organization for ServiceNow, uh, which is uh, I thought it was a unicorn, but it's like far beyond a unicorn now, based out of San Diego. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he has an interesting journey because he's one of the non-designers and uh, who now leads the design or built and is, leads the design operations and service design product. Yeah. Um, so he. Uh, the product and design leader behind ServiceNow's experience strategy on proving from products on platform to platform-based products as companies continue to scale. So it's a growing organization that he's uh, now trying to bring design and grow design uh, into. So, and uh, formerly in a variety of product development roles from Fortune 500 to startup-sized companies, resides in San Diego, like I mentioned, enjoys surfing, and motorcycles, reading, and the list goes on. Um, then we have Mohan uh, Krishnaraj, who's a VP and global head of UX design at uh, Harman International, which is a Samsung company. Um, he's an advocate for user-centric design with two decades of experience uh, in the industry. Uh, Mohan has proven record of enabling UX-led business transformation. So uh, that's an interesting perspective where he's trying to bring uh, design into a huge organization. Um, he, is, uh, he has mobilized teams across domains and geographies integrating data, design, and engineering to deliver seamless customer experience. And he's also an author of a new book that he's released in this uh, program, uh, Greater, Great Balancing Act from user, expect, user Expectations Versus Experience. So welcome the panelists. Um, so it's great to have you guys. And I, I strongly believe that design leadership changes or uh, based on the challenges we get and we're trying to solve. So uh, this is a perfect panel to, to bring that about. Um, so just though I have given a brief introductions of all of you, I would love to, um, oh, did I? No, I did, I did. 
Sorry, well, I would like to start uh, with uh, understanding a little bit context about the organization you're from, the role and the, the role design plays in your organization uh, briefly, so, so that the audience has a little bit perspective of why we're saying what we're saying. So do you want to start, Anand? Sure. Um, so uh, I lead Gramno. We are a design-led data science company. And uh, the bulk of our work is taking analysis which comes from machine learning and narrating them as stories. Uh, you've probably seen our work. If you've seen any of the uh, television coverage of the elections in the last five years, that's broadly our work. Uh, and the structure of the organization is like many of the organizations you will be working in. There's teams that have both designers and non-designers. In our case, the unusual thing is that we have statisticians working fairly closely with uh, designers. And there are also consultants and programmers who are tossed in into the mix. So typical workflows, for example, the meteorological department gave our analysts some temperature data, effectively district temp temperature for the last 100 years. The analyst processes that data, passes it on to a designer. Now the designer's job is to figure out what kind of visual representation makes it most useful for people to interpret. And they said, let's put it on a map and animate it over time, which a programmer took and created a visual out of and made a video into it. And then a consultant looked at it and said, wait a second, why is there a flashing spot right in the middle? And which led to the discovery of the district of Bilaspur being the only district in India which has a counter cyclic weather pattern. It's hot when the surrounding areas are cold and cold when the surrounding areas are hot. The role design plays here is in surfacing the insight from data in a way that hasn't been seen before. That's really what we do. Great. Uh, so I have the challenge of uh, convincing the larger organizations about design. So, which is, which is I'm, I'm sure it's not unique to me, which is a problem with most of the designers here. Uh, when it comes to business, every organizations are very different and their DNAs are different. As designers, we have to first uh, adapt ourselves to the DNA and then, you know, inject the design uh, fluids into them so it makes, then it makes sense to them because we, we have to be more empathetic to the business and the business stakeholders on what they would look for. So my role is pretty challenging in that way that uh, across Harman all the divisions have different DNAs and we need to kind of convince them why um, experience uh, plays a major role on it. So uh, with that, um, the design challenges that we go through in each of these divisions are very different and uh, probably we'll talk about a few examples yeah. going forward. Yeah, and specifically I was really intrigued by the fact that you lead human, which is a spin out, design studio, which is spun out of the organization. Yes. Uh, which is unlike many other organizations who are acquiring and I, we'll yeah. he hear that from Troy as well. So the lucky, the lucky really part was that the CEO is very committed to design. Uh -huh. So since the last 10 years, the design has been there, but he consolidated to make it like a human. Human is an agency that works within Harman, yeah. uh, going across. Yeah. Okay. Hi everyone, so um, I am the founder and principal designer at um, a startup called Rhizome. Uh, we work with holistic sustainability design and um, because everybody looks at the things holistically, everybody does everything there. Um, we work um, in an information systems model where things are very decentralized. So while we have our core team of designers and specialists, we work more as coordinators with other experts. Sometimes we build softwares for governments, sometimes um, we work a lot with institutions, sometimes we work with mainstreams like Godrej or Titan. And whatever money we make, we end up losing it by being Robin Hood and working with small startups. So that's pretty much what we do. Hi, my name is Troy Asmoon. I head up a product platform design at ServiceNow. Uh, it's been a long journey. I've been there since the beginning of the design journey at ServiceNow. So uh, something we might talk about later, but the, the current challenges that we are faced with revolve around uh, scalability, scaling from one to nearly infinity with our solutions that we design, and then also uh, ones of complexity. It's a highly complex environment, developing a platform that enables the creation of experiences versus products themselves and the abstraction thinking that's necessary for you to allow the creation of experiences. And then finally, and this is probably the one that would be most aligned with the challenges of leadership, 
uh, bringing the right collaboration across designers that are working on multiple product outcomes, designers working on platform core capability, uh, collaboration with engineering teams to see the value in the work we're doing, and finally, collaboration with people in product roles that are very focused on product-based outcomes. So now that we're, uh, the mic is with you, I'd just like to add an additional question around uh, your your case is specifically very interesting to me because you went in as a product design product manager, I think, mm -hmm. right? And then you grew uh, throughout. So I'm just interested in how the meaning of design leadership has changed or evolved through your career uh, in terms of and what were the triggers and moments that really made you what you are? Sure. Yeah. So uh, you know, for me, uh, I spent most of my career not in traditional design roles. I was in engineering and product management roles. Uh, I wasn't aware of the fact that I was a designer and I'd been a designer since I was probably around five or six years of age. Uh, it wasn't until I was in a management uh, role that I ran into people that did design professionally and I asked them, uh, uh, you know, I was curious subconsciously, I guess. And I asked if I could read a book on it, and I was recommended the, the classic Don Norman book on, on design, the design of everyday things. And I, I got about six pages into it, and I just put the, desk, uh, put the book down on my desk, and I thought, oh my God, I'm a designer. And so I suddenly just changed my career path and bought every book on design that I could get in one order from Amazon and disappeared for half a year and then came back and started thinking about all my problems uh, consciously from a design perspective. And then the background in, in engineering and product was actually very helpful. It was almost like an investment you know, over time that starts to have compounding interest. And so I could look at a design issue and, and see the engineering reasons or the possibilities based on the engineering uh, challenges and then on the product side, the outcome needs. And so coming into service now, uh, there was no design, like I mentioned, uh, when, I, when I came there, we were at the beginning. Uh, there had been attempts to bring design in, but, but the attempts had been very design outcome focused versus product outcome or engineering constraint focused, and so there had been no traction. So when I came in to do product, uh, you know, I saw problems that were product outcome problems, or maybe they were engineering problems, and I framed them as such with those stakeholders but the solutions that I'd presented were design solutions. So, you know, one example I mentioned to you the other day was uh, when I came there, it was, it was considered normal to right-click on the interface in the browser to find controls to do work. It's not very discoverable, of course. Uh, so I mentioned that, and the founder of the company, who, who was my mentor, just looked at me blankly and said, we've been doing it that way for 10 years, and we're worth $10 billion. How much are you worth? So I didn't really have a response to that uh, initially, but I thought about it for a day and I came back and I said, well, if we're gonna build a mobile product, are we gonna have people long press on the UI, on the phone? That's not gonna work. And they said, okay, well, what do we do? And I said, this was a 2013 or 2014. And I said, well, there's this new thing called a hamburger. And so then, you know, a month later we had, we were like Burger King, there were hamburgers everywhere. So we had to reel that in and, and reduce the amount of hamburgers, uh, but that was the start. And it built some credibility as to the, the needs of thinking about design. And we, we built it from there. And, and then over time, we could bring in professionals that were design-centric and bring in design language because we'd shown value based on these product engineering perspectives. Yeah. Anand, I'm curious because you're also a non-designer, but you're an entrepreneur first. You started this uh, company with a vision and uh, now you have to deal with designers. I, I'm just curious about some of your... Uh, it's thoughts. particularly tough because, uh, sorry, I'm just curious, how many of you here don't have a design degree? Just raise your hands. Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so this is for all those non-designers, right? I'm in good company. We are, we are in good company. Um, so my, uh, the only design course that I took in college, my teacher gave me an F which is the only F that I ever <laughs> got like in life. And she said, Anand, look, just make sure you don't get into design as a career. <laughs> and literally here I am right now. She, no, she wouldn't be thrilled. She'd just be, she'd turn her head in despair, the state of design in India maybe. But the point is this, um, you can learn. And that's really what we've been doing. For me, that was the biggest personal thing because from there I then had to start by leading a team of designers. And uh, at that point, I realized that it was beyond personal learning. It was more about mentoring. The uh, thing is, I'm not someone who can mentor somebody to 
create great designs. But the niche that I found there was interesting because it was around helping people not create bad designs. Ultimately, there are a hundred ways of getting things wrong and a few ways, niche ways of getting things amazing. Yeah. My job, it turned out, as somebody who's leading a team, was making sure that people don't mess up so badly on areas so that the beauty of what they're creating comes out. How do you do that? Checklists, for instance. So since we deal with data, one of the basic uh, things that you need to watch out for is make sure that you always limit the number of categories. A designer creates a bar chart with four categories. The actual data has 40 categories, and you can't even read the numbers. Or um, let's take names. The designer says, just put in the label. When the programmer puts in the label, let's say, for election coverage, it turns out that there's one candidate whose name is Manu, Manu Ganapati Ramakrishna Jayanti. Now, that's not going to fit on this uh, on any screen. Right. Uh, so you've got to watch out for this and put in ellipses. And these are elements that constitute a, a checklist of what not to get wrong, uh -huh. uh, which doesn't quite take you to the wow factor, but at least allows you not to be inhibited by a certain uh, element. And that was the big learning. How does one transition from being personally a good designer to being a mentor? The next transition was how does this apply to the industry as a whole? I mean, how does one translate a vision, in my case it was dealing with data, to something that the world can apply. And uh, there my learning was that there are patterns everywhere. There are patterns of visuals and interactions that map to specific patterns of insights. And if you do a certain kind of analysis, invariably there's an association with a certain way of representing it. And that was a pretty big learning. So overall the transition has been, like I said, right, from getting an F in design to, well, sitting in a panel among yeah. designers has been yeah. odd. So that takes me to the next question, Mohan, if you can uh, take the mic. You know, how's, we talked about leadership a lot in the morning. We talked about empathy, ability to drive discussions, and so many things, right, we heard uh, from Andy. Uh, I'm curious, how is design leadership different from any other leadership uh, form? And I know it is different, uh, but I would like you to talk about some of those additional things that you have to do while you're leading a design organization. <clears throat> I think personal experience also is that uh, as designers we get too lost into design world and we, we are more a community oriented, we are in the family, we remain in the family and want to be within that sensitivity and every designer I agree to some extent is very sensitive. We discussed this also that we have sensitivities at different levels we and try. with that sensitivity we probably do not explore more into what's happening in the organization on the other side. So which means that how is design impacting? How do I quantify design? How do I prove this, that this is the revenue that the organization is getting because of me or, a, or because of design that I have done as a designer? So these are things that are generally not a comfort zone for a designer, but that's what will lead to become leaders. Mm -hmm. But to become leaders, you have to be all-rounded, so you need to understand those aspects. If any junior designer can hold a conversation with a C-level or a CEO that, you know, your product might have a disruption coming by because your competition is doing something different and we are not following that. If you are doing the same thing, then we might go down uh, in over time. So these are certain things that, that has to come out of uh, the instinct and come out of the comfort zones and do this. Uh, like I said, it is not an easy path and uh, designers are like the crown jewel. Uh, but never crowned. So uh, like when I say that, it's more uh, difficult to get a position on the board or sit on the board to make a decision or even make a, be an influencer for a decision uh, because design is always thought like uh, um, a cost or it's more of a, an investment to make it look better. But today's world has really changed. Design is the, uh, you know, the tip of the arrow that gets the whole thing into the organization. So as long as uh, that realization is coming from every organization, but still, the positions of the leaderships is always, uh, you know, restricted to other leadership, but not for the design leadership yet. Anyone wants to add to that? So, um, in my experience, um, everybody actually designs, right? And there are so many books and seminal books on design which say that everybody who um, figures out what they want to do and the best way to do it is a designer. So, I think um, the issue really is with professional designers or educated designers who have received an education. 
And the fact is that in the real world, whatever your expertise, unless you talk to the other people, you know, who you work with in a way which all of you can together build a solution, it's not going to work. So as uh, Mohan talked about um, design being the tip of an arrow, it doesn't mean design through a professional designer as in an educated designer. Because often um, professions leak expertise into each other and if this didn't happen, every expertise would just throw a solution over the wall to the next guy who doesn't know why that happened and what to do with it. And eventually what comes out, and often it happens in design teams in larger companies, the end solution is a Frankenstein which everybody threw over the wall and nobody wants to now have accountability for it. Mm. And nobody feels accountable because you just did a small slice of, you know, the design process. So um, I think that for me, a design leader and what is so important about design leadership is the aspect of being able to see a coordinated, you know, kind of compound picture, negotiating it and um, actually being more of a listener and a coordinator rather than the solution provider. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to sound very preachy here, so I, I do want to jump on to some of the challenges, but just to remind, there will be chance to ask uh, audience questions. So. Uh, all those designers and non-designers, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hands and we can uh, ask along the way. Um, but so, I, you know, I, I, it was interesting. I, I, do you have anything to say? Yeah, go ahead. Maybe. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, for, so designing, uh, design and leadership, uh, to, to to Mohan's point, it's, there's the, the challenge around the sensitivity. I think as designers, we tend to be very introspective uh, because we're thinking about others and, and trying to be them sometimes to put ourselves in their shoes. Uh, and sometimes that works against us because, you know, as a stakeholder, we, we sometimes shy away from the conflict or we're, we're busy in our own yes. world thinking about the problem. Uh, and it happens, I think it happens to everybody, whether you're, you know, a new designer or you're a design manager or a design VP. Uh, th that's part of you. That's part of the reason you, you got into design. Uh, but the thing to remember, regardless of your role, and the thing at least that I remember sometimes when I have to get up and, and lead, is that though I might have this inclination to just, you know, kind of ruminate, uh, ultimately I, I came here to make sure that the people that use our product, whatever the product may be, uh, come first. And so I think everybody can agree they want happy customers. And, and, you know, if, if it means I have to go out of my comfort zone to make sure that we have customers that are, that are happy with our product and we do something we can be proud of, then damn it, I'm going to get up and I'm going to get out of my shell and I'm going to say, hey, we've got to do something or it's not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. Um, since you say about, um, you know, what do users want, a lot of design these days is actually much more participatory you know, it's actually users who are designing stuff. So as a designer, you're not designing a product or a system or a solution. You're actually doing meta design, where you're designing a method which allows the user to design. So this is, you know, something that's, um, again, throwing up the, ro uh, the role of the contemporary design leader, the role of the contemporary designer is not actually finding the solution, but designing the system that finds the solution. That's a really good point and I think uh, one of my mentors, Larry Keeley, he always said, we have design methods to, uh, to provide. To, what we want to do is reduce the risk of failure, right? So what you're doing is providing processes and methods to say that, okay, uh, there will always be a risk, but uh, you know, the risk, market risk, business risk and technical risk is a little less because now we have a certain method to, to follow. So yeah, that's a, a good ad. Uh, so, w what are some of the challenges, I mean, Rebecca, uh, that you as a design leader uh, have to face? And I know you work with the government, you work with bodies, uh, nonprofits, organizations, but uh, I, I think there's, I, I just want to introduce to the audience, like, there's a lot more to designing pretty pictures and pretty objects. And, and I am really curious about some of the stuff you are doing and bringing to our country. So, um, actually we work in the domain of sustainability, which is um, a discipline in flux. Nobody has unraveled it yet and nobody has cracked it yet and if they had cracked it, there would be no climate change. So, it doesn't look like anyone's cracking it um, anytime soon. 
but similarly in the and simultaneously there's this explosion of innovation from different disciplines who want to provide inputs or want to provide a piece that might solve the puzzle if not the entire picture so um, for us we have our clients who are basically um, sustainability evaders they don't want to be sustainable because sustainability costs money it they don't see it as an investment they see it as an expense mm -hmm. And on the other side, you see the governments or the publics or institutions who find themselves in the sad role of policing sustainability, but they don't know what it's about either because actually no one knows what it's about. So um, at that sense, um, at some level you have to be a design activist. So being a design leader is about being a design activist where you find an opportunity, find a solution, create a system to do that, then convince policy makers on what that system is, and then convince um, mainstreams as to why they should follow that system and why that makes like economic sense to both parties. So for one of them it's economic sense and for one of them it's political or ethical sense, you know. So in that sense, often I think design leaders are also design activists because they're chartering new territories of opportunity. Yeah, it's interesting what you're doing at a government level. I feel like having worked with G companies like GE, it's like internally you're doing the same thing. You're, you're advocating. I mean, I, I would always introduce myself as an advocate for user, you know, perspective. Uh, so you're doing the same fights. You're trying to get the budgets for, you know, the value of research and, and design. So it's interesting how you kind of bring it to the uh, other level. So anything to add to some of the challenges and new challenges that we haven't talked about yet? So more from design challenges, I think uh, as projects, uh, <coughs> as organizations, everything will be going fine. From a very designer's hard perspective, when you see everything is going fine, is also not a good state to be in. And if, if Kotak is an example that we can take as an organization, they did really well and everything was going fine. But there was something that was coming by which is disruption. And that challenge is something that nobody can easily identify. But yes, the only person who can identify is designer from my perspective. So what can disrupt? What is coming by? What is the competition doing? How are we doing best? What is the industry going forward? So the design challenges, it doesn't end with doing something right and finishing with the organization, but also challenging that. I would disagree a little bit saying not only designers, I think non-designers equally can, you know, look for that disruption as long as they're empathetic, right? They understand the, the human behavior and what's coming all along. But the eyes on design is only by the designers. It's they only care about the user experience, right? The yeah. users are the ones who will get disrupted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, we face a slightly different kind of a challenge uh, on the data design side, interestingly. And it has to do with the ethics of uh, what gets published. Given that it's data and it's therefore evidently fact-based, at least in a certain sense. Uh, actually, uh, post the Cambridge Analytica scandal, for instance, and it just broke out and everybody was <coughs> concerned about how elections can be rigged, and that was a bit before the Karnataka elections here. Um, at least three media agencies called asking, look, is this really possible? Can we do it in India? Incidentally, six politicians asked, calling if, called asking if they, we can actually do it for them. So there's always this trade-off of can data be used um, <coughs> for the wrong purpose. And you've probably heard this joke, right? The, uh, a mathematician, a physicist, and uh, an accountant are asked, what is 2 plus 2? The mathematician says 4. The, account, the physicist says approximately 4. The accountant walks over and says, what do you want it to be? So ultimately data can give you any kind of answer and we face this kind of a challenge particularly when we were designing for uh, the UP government a health indicator. Uh, the question is each district has a health performance as an absolute number. Now the numbers may all increase, the numbers may all decrease, we could show them as absolute values or we could show it as ranks for each of the districts. The trouble is when all of the numbers are consistently increasing everything looks good and we're fine. That technically reflects the state of affairs. But the intent that the minister had was to make sure that he energizes the team at any point to make sure there is consistent improvement. So the intent was to make sure that at least half of them or whatever are not performing well enough and therefore use the ranking. The ranking will rise or fall no matter how the absolute performance is going. So I think one of the challenges that we have is the trade-off between a known intent 
which is essential because otherwise you won't quite know why you're communicating what you're communicating and the ethics of pushing an intent through that design that's a constant battle i don't know if there's an answer to it but it's something to factor in yeah uh, troy i'm curious uh, yours is a really fast growing uh, company as what i see uh, uh, what are some of the challenges related to scaling yeah so we have had scaling challenges i think from the very beginning you know initially like like i mentioned we had no designers so once myself and one engineer took off our disguises and we became designers uh, it was it was two designers and 2500 engineers and then uh, you know from there we had to figure out how to grow the team because now we had acceptance and hiring the right people out of the gate was super challenging uh, because nobody knew who we were and so it meant that we had to burn a lot of calories finding people and going through a lot of the wrong people and then you know to grow quickly we looked at acquisitions we conducted an acquisition uh, that doubled our team from about 20 designers to 40 designers. That was extremely challenging. It was very risky. Uh, there was no one else I could go to and ask. You know, ultimately, I was the only person that, that would be accountable. And there was no one there to, to get really you know, a uh, encouragement from because it was kind of the blind leading the blind, really. So uh, I, that was a really great memory, actually. If you ever do an acquisition, uh, which you may, no one goes to acquisition school, I don't think, so you may think this won't apply to you, but it very, mal, very well may someday apply to you. You may be that person or one of those people looking at joining with another company. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind in that situation is there'll be a day when you wake up during the process and you realize that you would never want to work at that company uh, or the day that you realize you would work at that company and then you have your answer and then you go all the way. You go all the way. You either run, run away screaming or you get as much money together as you can and you buy that company. And so that's the, that's the process really for that. You, you got to use your gut because there's not time. You're not going to get all the data either. Obviously, when you're looking at other companies, they're not going to tell you everything, right? So uh, there's a lot of intuition needed. Yeah. So culture is king when you're doing that kind of a, a merger of, of, of cultures, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, that was a big challenge. And, and like I mentioned earlier, the, big, the, the real big challenges now are how do you really scale when, when, you've, when you've reached kind of a, a, that level where you've got multiple products, multi-billion dollar uh, you know, revenue coming in, and you've got you know, dozens of designers joining you know, every couple of months? H how do we educate these folks? How do we make them effective? And you know, it, that's all really about finding common denominators in the experiences. And, as a leader communicating a vision of what the purpose is. Because the yeah. problems are so big, it'd be like if you want to get to the moon, right? You want to put a person on the moon. It's not like one person's going to be, be building the rocket and designing the rocket and flying the rocket. You, you're going to have thousands of people. One person just works on the fuel tank. One person just flies the rocket. One person just goes on the moon. And you've got to be that person that's like, Everybody, we're going to the moon. Today we got one tail fin done on the rocket. That is awesome. We're 0.2% closer to 100%. And just being that person that can keep the vision and never give up. And then when people think that there's too much to do, they can at least see that eventually we're going to the moon. Yeah. That's a key part of leadership, yeah. design or any. Yeah. You know, we heard the Steve Jobs video. Uh, I think that's what he was saying. But I, I see two approaches a lot of organizations take. Is One is leave their risk on one person like Steve Jobs to run the show. And then there are other organizations like PNG, where AJ Lafley really infused design in the culture of the organization. And so I, I feel like that one is less risky because you, you're not, with the loss of Steve Jobs, things still, you know, are different. So I don't know, I'm just specifically interested in Mohan being in a big corporation. What is, the, what is the path you guys take in terms of creating a culture versus leadership in that sense? Yeah, culture-wise, I think <clears throat> when, uh, when large companies merge between many companies, there's a mix of a lot of cultures. So when you see a lot of cultures coming in, there are some design-oriented culture because design-oriented culture has to come from top down. Otherwise, it's very difficult to survive in the organization. So uh, anybody trying to infuse design from a lower end is, is absolutely zero, I would say, because the design has to be valued from top down, which is why <coughs> most of my conversation is on 
how much can you hold conversations with that level who can make a difference to it. So as long as those levels understand the importance, then the culture will trickle down, uh, down the path. But within the teams, I'm sure the excitement is more on what sort of uh, jobs are they getting? What sort of activity are they getting to do? Are they getting the monotonous wireframe designs, visual designs kind of a job? Or is it exciting that we can talk to customers and try to make, try to be a part of their vision to make a change in the futuristic design? So if that is that excitement is there, then designers would stay with any culture. Yeah. They would still live with the culture because they they are excited about the work. Mm -hmm. Or in many organizations, mostly the culture plays a bigger role where they stay back for culture if the work is not happy. Yeah. So. No, uh, I'm curious. What do you mean when you say design culture, creating a design culture? What are the ingredients? If so mainly all? appreciating culture, appreciating the design culture, taking the point of views of designers or the design uh, thoughts. And uh, everybody in the room is not sticking to a project plan and a requirement document that comes with a customer. So they're allowing scope to go out of the scope and have those discussions. So these are the different types of cultures that comes in. Right. Most, most often bureaucracy and red tape stop these things. So if we're, if we're able to cut through that, um, is. is the culture I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Uh, I want to open up the questions to, since we're at the challenges stage, I'm sure all of you guys working in different organizations have questions, so. Hi, uh, this is Ashish here. I run a design studio called Net Brahma in Bangalore. We've been around for 12 years now. Uh, so my question to you guys is, uh, uh, where do you see design leadership in the next five years? Because we all know the current state, we all know what we've gone through. But uh, what does it take to see the next five years more specifically in terms of India and obviously the global landscape? Where do you see design, design leadership? Well, what are the interesting things or patterns uh, you know, insights that you guys Great can. Great question. So, the future of design leadership. Who wants to take that? Do you want that? to point it to anyone or? I think it's a general question. Yeah, whoever. I'm sure there's a bunch of patterns. One that I see is uh, designers becoming not just, design leaders being not just designers, but designers and other things. Uh, I can certainly say that there's an increasing number of design leaders who are actually developers. There's a fairly large number of design leaders who are domain experts and won't be long because before there are design leaders who come from an analytical background. And uh, this change, I think, leads to a couple of things. One, a certain amount of fragmentation or specialization. I mean, just like so, medicine evolved into specialism to the point of you have an ENT doctor and so on. That's uh, certainly one trend that I am seeing. But also the cross-pollination of, well, people like myself and Troy, who are not designers themselves, who are coming into design, bringing in a certain amount of uh, our own backgrounds into this. So it, on the one hand, means proliferation. It, on the other hand, means, means combination with other fields. That's definitely one trend. No, I, uh, I was trying to say that, you know, most often this cross-pollination, like you said rightly, is, is great. The same thing is required from designers also to cross-pollinate into other <laughs> yes. divisions. So that, that, that brings more leadership. And as, as we can see from year, years to year, we are seeing a lot of startups. That is that they are wriggling out of the overall clutches they have within the organization and they want to get free and do something that they really envision. If those company becomes big tomorrow is when the design leaderships also will reach the boards faster. I mean, it need not have to wait for five years, I'm sure, but it's, it's going to reach faster. And if any design-led organizations will always be, um, the, you know, the futuristic path for us. Yeah. So we've actually been studying from a client whose name, I, for a client whose name I cannot disclose, um, the role of designers in organizations and strategies. And um, based on our studies, what we can figure out is that um, designers are actually ideally placed to do bigger things than what they're doing. But if you look at the emergence of the role of the designer over time, so in the 80s, it was very much the designer as a superstar. So you had these um, post-Bahos leftover like product designers like Philip Stark or, you know, um, post-modern designers. After that, in the 19s, you had this whole phase of designers being uh, design managers. So uh, managing teams of people who are producing or designing stuff for markets which are not local. And um, now you see more designers as key strategists to the um, pulse of the business. So 
there are actually a lot of studies which depict the role of the designers and they point from designers being eye-shaped designers, that is domain experts, you know, where you have a little at the top and a little at the bottom, to designers being T-shaped designers where you know a lot and you also talk to a lot of people, to O-shaped designers where you know everything and you're looking at everyone but perhaps you don't have domain expertise in anything and your job is actually to become uh, interfaced or uh, networked with other T-shaped members of an innovation team who may not be designers but may be part of the design process. So, I mean, science indicates that's where design is going in terms of uh, leadership. Yeah. And I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, a great, when we talked about this the other day, a great product person, if you work with them, uh, they'd be they'd be solid designers too, and, and the same thing holds true for a designer. They're they're going to make a great product person, or they're going to make a great designer if they're a product person, or designer or product person if they're a designer. Uh, you know, it's because they have context and empathy. So, for the designer to become an effective leader, you know, they've got to start building context around why are we doing what we're doing, not just for the end user enjoying it, but the business outcome. You know, in, in the, that's really going to be the, the unifying theme across business leaders. You know, uh, I think it's an old saying that profit is a, is a cross-functional uh, uh, goal. So, you know, if you're focused on creating a product that will sell uh, and that's the motivation behind your design decisions, then that's the kind of leadership that will communicate very well across the C-suite in your organization. You know, and it's funny, as researchers or designers, we are so trained to empathize with our users. Even if we use like 50 to 70% of that empathy with empathizing with our internal stakeholders, I think we can do magic. Uh, that's been my experience uh, anyways. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry, can I go? Oh, here, yes. Hi, my name is Prachi. I'm a user experience researcher with Microsoft. Uh, building on Ashish's question, right? We touched on culture, ethics, um, advocacy. So as uh, design has these really powerful tools to change culture, I would love for the panel to share examples of, you know, looking a little inward, if you've used these tools to um, change the culture of your organization, your team, or a person for the better in, in any way. Thank you. Great question. Uh, one thing that I found very powerful is language training. Just helping designers express themselves. One part of the question is, uh, here's the design. Why is this what it is? And uh, coaching them in uh, explaining the design in a way that different kinds of audiences can understand. So that's one kind of linguistic surgery that helps. The other, which is perhaps more important, is language training in interpretation. The client says, you know, I don't get this wow feeling. Yeah, so instead of uh, taking a, a deep sigh and just walking away. It's about saying, okay, let's translate that into potential set of possibilities. Do you think that it's the color scheme that doesn't work? Leading uh, an inquiry, but making sure that they're trained on the right kind of words to use at these situations, that's probably had the best impact. I mean, just letting people know that they could explore with curiosity and you know, literally use the words. I'm curious why makes a huge difference in comparison to the normal language that we've, we've seen designers use in the past. That's definitely had the largest cultural shift that we've seen. So um, generally when people come from different disciplines, they're trained to ask different types of questions. So say a scientist or somebody who's working um, with very absolute answers would ask a what question. What happens when this these two things uh, come together. Um, people who come from, say, the social sciences ask the why questions. You know, why is this person responding like that? As designers, we ask how questions, which first, look at what happens, second, why it happens, and how can we influence or change that, and basically change reality. 
So I think that the greatest cultural shift in our um, organization is asking people to not just jump to the how questions, but look at a scientific perspective, both from very quantitative aspects, also from very cultural why questions, and then come in as a designer. And again, when I say as a designer, I don't mean a professional designer, I mean anybody on board the design process, which for us is everybody. Everybody has an opinion, and we think that's great, that everybody should have an opinion. And um, I often tell my team that, you know what, whether you like what he or she is saying or not, it is free advice. Do what you want with it, but please listen. So getting people to think in a more um, scientific sense in terms of taking feedback and deciding what you want to filter and what to apply is a great cultural shift that's happening in our organization. Yeah. One of the powers of innovation is you don't have to have answers to all the questions and I feel like especially when I grew up and like as an industrial designer my first job and all that we were hesitant to ask questions because we thought we don't have enough experience but I would challenge those uh, young designers to, to ask questions irrespective because you know the, que the, the people you're asking those questions I bet you they don't know the answers either so I think it's more important to, to ask the good questions or the right questions um, to, to uh, move forward. Uh, any other questions? Hello. Yeah. I'm a CX professional. Uh, though there is a, a lot of overlap between the UX and CX, mm. and actually both are meant for the improving the customer's experience or the user's experience, I see one area where there is a slight conflict or at least in practice it appears. Uh, unlike the UX, CX focus more on the multiple touch point of entire journey. The conflicts happens here that CX is towards more the customer centric and UX appears to be more product centric or the offering centric. So how to navigate these conflicts uh, to make more synergy between the CX to empower the customer experience that's the questions to the panel. So mostly um, the question between, it's, it's a thin line between UX and CX all the time. So typically when you design it for users, the, you, the way they use it, the way, they were, the way you can persuade them is different while uh, when the CX part comes, it's more of a larger audience and how uh, most often, how can we design for a larger community? I mean, this is typically the difference like, uh, MVP is more of a viable product which is a tolerable design but uh, MLP is a lovable product which more a group of people loves it. So when you're designing more for a larger audience then the considerations is different against one particular user that you're targeting to make sure he's happy. So we, we, we've gone through the personas path and we've, we've seen making it user centric but more culture, cultural aspects are coming into where you, uh, the customers from different regions have different expectations. So matching that is more of a customer experience that brings in a larger uh, uh, view to it. Any other thoughts? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I just uh, think uh, previously a lot of companies were focused on products. So user experience was really important, how they engage, how they feel, how they, you know, use a particular thing. But I think now uh, we've re realized over time that service is really important, how you treat your customer, how you sell the product, how you launch the, to the market, all those are also important and design can, designers can help with that. That's the biggest part. So I think that's uh, the, the way I see the difference. Uh, so quick answer is UX is part of CX. <laughs> There's a question here. Good morning, I have a question to the panel. In an age of uh, remote working becoming a pattern, what barriers do you have or experience with designers or UX teams? And how do you feel the age of remote working could be made a success with design leadership? Your thoughts, please. Yeah. So to take that question, it's how much remote is the question again? So. Most often organizations decides to be 80% remote and 20% on site with the customer. But there has to be some representations on site or with the customer to make sure the rest of the remote works fine. So when I say this, 
uh, there has to be one representation who is bringing in that cultural aspect of all the remote and capturing all of the remote aspects and making sure he is representing it well. Just to represent they will be like 20% or 10% whatever the organization decides uh, to have it with in front of the customers to make sure that the remote is successful. Completely remote is still not a viable option with all our uh, aspects that we have. Uh, even, even we talk about so much of technology implementations, but we still struggle connectivity on phone. We can't still take our mobile, the calls on mobiles yet. So we are still not there from an overall connectivity perspective, but remote working as a process works fantastically if you have a representation of certain percentage on with the customer so that the communication is happening clear and face to face and every representation is clear to them. While on calls, while on WebEx, we can do as much possible, but uh, the cultural differences might come in. I mean, typically we have these examples of India working with uh, Europe where we are doing something for Dutch and working with China teams to do something on industrial design. So we have a lot of challenges when it comes to cultural fitment itself. So that's where, you know, with a team of about, uh, about 300 in human, which is part of Herman, we have about 40 nationalities, so which is why it brings a lot of uh, betterment when, when you build the teams to have different nationalities within, then the, the globalization or the globalization becomes easier. Uh, though, uh, I'll probably take a slightly different view to that. In our case, the trade-off has been that remote is not an option. It is necessary. I mean, sometimes even within uh, within the country, uh, one lady in, uh, in Nagpur, one in Mumbai, and we just can't get them all together. So yes, it does have an impact on quality. But oddly enough, by just being forced into a remote environment, I'm finding that our ways of working asynchronously are improving. So we're finding the tools and having people put the comments and learning how to put comments better, which actually improves the work-life balance a bit because then it's not something that they all, that a large number of people have to come together and so on. So if it's possible to experiment with a pure remote environment in a few cases, I think the learning that comes out of it is quite promising. Yeah, with, with remote teams, you, you do need to have some physical connection at some, there either has to be a stakeholder that's in one location or the other or, or at least the teams come together. Uh, the the re big reason for that is that yeah, in design, I think everybody would agree there needs to be a certain level of joy. Uh, but for there to be joy, there needs to be an, a, a certain uh, authentic relationship where people really appreciate each other's uh, contributions and company. And for that to happen, there's, there's no more effective way than to sit down face to face and work through some problems together, uh, even you know, go out to dinner, tell a few jokes. That sort of stuff creates the bond. And, and once you've done that, then, then you can go to the remote situation and you, you have a certain level of camaraderie that's almost impossible to achieve if you, if you don't take the time to make that initial investment. So it's, it's not a black and white. I think that there's a, a gray area there that will allow you to create that, that sense of, of community with your teams regardless of where they're at. Absolutely valid point. I mean, how many of you in this audience would be interested if all of us were on the screen? Hello. Uh, yeah, one more question, question Shilpi. Yeah, go ahead. My name is Uvarun. Uh, earlier, Shilpi, you spoke about jobs and how a personality like that represented design at Apple, right? And how what his absence would mean for that. And Mohan very aptly spoke about culture and how culture is much bigger than a figurehead, right? So I'm going to ask a bit about culture. I work with this, uh, I work at the startup called Bizongo. We're on uh, LinkedIn's list of top 25 startups to work for currently. We place a lot of emphasis on culture. And right now we're scaling up a lot. We're hiring designers, we're hiring design leaders. And as an organization that emphasizes on culture, we have a fairly well-defined culture. While we scale up, I've seen that it's one of the easiest things to lose culture, right? How do we maintain culture as we scale up uh, and across locations? I'm particularly interested in what uh, Troy would have to say because uh, ServiceNow is spread across locations, there are lots of people and so on. Sure, so uh, as an example, you know, when we decided to, to grow our design team here in Hyderabad, 
uh, myself and our, our head of user research, uh, we took a lot of time uh, out of our schedules to personally be involved in, in every single uh, interview. So, you know, we probably did about, you know, once they came to the point where we had a face-to-face -face type of interview, we did about 50 of them. And of those 50, we, we ended up with three or four uh, designers that, that formed our core team. And the, the rule that we made for ourselves is we're not hiring anybody that we wouldn't want showing up in our office in San Diego, California tomorrow. It, so it's, it's all about not taking any shortcuts on the, on the starting kernel, right? It's just like your design, if you're doing architectural design. You've got to have sound principles for the starting architecture of your design or the whole thing will collapse a few months later. And I think that's really the secret. And what happens is companies and organizations just want to grow really quickly and they take a few shortcuts and hope for the best. And, and then it just, it's like a snowball. It starts rolling downhill and next thing you know, you've got this, this office where they say, oh, those guys are in the other office and you know, we don't want to work with them. We do it our own way. We're better than, than everybody else type of stuff. So you have to be very conscious of, of that. And when you do start building the organization, invest the time to, to either bring them over or vice versa. You send people to that team to make sure that it, it builds as one team, not two separate teams in the same company. I hope that helps. Uh, that did help. Anything else from the other folks on the panel? Okay, I, I can take it. Um, so mostly culture is, I would say, I mean, you would have seen families with 100, 150 people, they take big pictures all together. Right? There are some fundamentals that pass through from the two pair that they started, right? Like a startup, they start small and the culture uh, goes down. But as long as, how much do you allow dilution is what uh, matters. How much, how much of seriousness is there on the culture? If somebody is doing something beyond the cultural ethics of the company, how seriously is that treated? And uh, it, it has to be top down again. And uh, how much of dilution are you allowing? Like um, every aspect of a culture needs to be treated like more like a process, more like a, uh, a non-compliance to things not being followed as a culture. And if a non-culture fit can actually be uh, a reason for a person to be you know, taken out of the system. I mean, to that level, if it is serious, then the dilution is very limited. Everybody will believe, and from the, the belief on the culture is what will take us places. So for us, we've figured out that, um, first of all, um, for like promoting a culture or maintaining a culture, we don't believe it should be done or that it can be done without everyone being on board. So uh, for us, we uh, work with a lot of companies who come to us with this issue of having some kind of a ethos for the institution. And it's especially difficult when there are so many cogs in the machinery. So you have a government, you have an NGO, you have, and everybody is working as one big team. So um, what's really important is to communicate a vision to have the guts to change the vision. If there is a vision shift, admit it. And understand what implicit changes that mean in the culture of you know the institution or the culture of uh, the project happening and most importantly we have discovered for us like this kind of a compliance approach that um, you know if you don't fit in there with the culture you get cut loose or whatever it doesn't work so there's a carrot and a stick approach and we feel that as an organization you are comprised of small parts so unless everybody is on board you know it is not the culture of the organization because everybody makes the organization, you just have the vision and everybody shows different ways how to implement it. So if, if you're not willing to move, change or open up, you will eventually die if you don't evolve. Yeah, and I think meeting culture is the biggest pain point I've suffered through in my early career ages where, you know, you wait till a meeting and remote work question also is, is the same thing. You know, you're, when you're remotely connecting, you always have a purpose. I think people should meet without a purpose. And that's where, what sparks new ideas. So I, I think that's... Uh, at the same uh, time, I would say that if you don't fit into the culture, please get out of that system because that may not be your culture to fit into it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think uh, my big question is what is culture? How do you define culture? You know, what are some of the key words or things that you think when you say culture, what does it mean? You know, uh, question to panel. Sure, I'll, I'll 
uh, well, it's very simple, but what I always tell people, uh, you know, a good culture is a, a culture where you don't do anything that you couldn't explain to your mom. So, so you're treating other people, you know, uh, as equals and being transparent about what you're asking for and, and being authentic are, are key parts of it and also being yourself. You simply can't create a, a great culture if people are afraid to show who they really are. So that means, you know, different, different ways of talking, different ways of thinking, different viewpoints, uh, you know, great cultures and business settings, uh, there's, there's that freedom to be yourself, but there's also an expectation of results. So yeah, you know, that person might have some pretty strange views, but that's great design work, and they're also very open to my strange views from their perspective. So there you've got a great culture. You've got a great business culture because you've, you've got that diversity, but you've got a shared, a shared focus on let's make the best product we can possibly make. And on top of it, we're talking about design culture, which is really sharing shared values on what design is or what design can do, right? Right. In, in it, yeah, in the sense in equality of, you know, we may be different, but we can all agree that we want to be the best designers we can be and we're going to help each other get there. Yeah, yeah right. nice. So as we wrap up, I just want to uh, ask a closing uh, question to the panel. Uh, what advice would you give to the group of young designers or non-designers as they evolve um, into a design leadership or leadership role in organizations? I mean, I, I would clearly say that any, uh, there is no levels in designs because any fresh graduates coming out of designers, uh, how much of our years we have spent in design, we definitely will be more eager to learn from them because they come with fresh thoughts. And design is all about fresh thoughts, new blood, new thinking. Uh, once we start getting into a comfort zone of, yeah, I have done enough and I've learned enough, now I can start relaxing a bit, that's when uh, the, the positions die out, the, uh, the potential dies out and the opportunity dies out. But every uh, aspects of the newcomers that needs to be showcased well, you need to get access. Don't get into organizations which are very stringent on, on that aspect where you don't get a culture to be open, where you don't get a culture to have, express your uh, perspectives like you said. So most importantly, expressing your perspectives is very important. And uh, if you can't convince your design, if you are not confident about your design, who else can be? Right? It is your design. So as long as you can take it to any level and talk about it strongly, that will take you places. So that's the only advice I would say. And if you do get stuck in an organization like that, then you have to have the ability to take risk and speak up, I think, so. I'd say teach as you learn. It's a good way of learning in the first place, but it also puts you in a position to be able to mentor people, which will typically be your next role. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So I'd, I'd say there's a f three things. Uh, Great designership, you're only as good as your last product, and don't let anybody else define who you are. You get that. You get to define who you are. I mean, everybody on the stage has been told they can't do it because of whatever stupid reason someone told them, can't be done, or, or you're no good at it. You get to make that choice as a designer, and that includes if you're not getting the support you need, uh, if the organization doesn't understand your value, you know, you get to make the final call. Everybody here, I think, had a mentor at least once or twice in their career that believed in them. And everybody deserves that opportunity to have somebody in your career that believes in you, and they see your potential, and they give you the challenges you need to grow. Yeah, so for me, um, the advice I would give is be fearless. Um, be fearless even in making mistakes. Um, be fearless in getting up, own whatever you do. Um, there'll be a lot of times when things go wrong. Make sure that's not because you didn't put in the work. Make sure that if you are wrong, it's a learning experience. So work hard, don't complain, and be honest. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a great advice uh, from the panel. I know the crowd is starting to get hungry now, so we're going to, um, unless there's some pressing question from the audience, I think we're going to um, say thank you to be a good listener and good questions today. Uh, that was a very interesting panel, uh, a lot of good questions, a lot of great answers, and I could see the audience were hooked. They're still here, in fact. Uh, 
So a uh, round of applause uh, for our panel and uh, thank you Shilpi for moderating it. It was very well done and uh, I would like to call upon stage Mr. Narendra uh, who is the co-chair uh, for UX India to distribute uh, a token of appreciation from our side. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Oh, I don't know. Oh, thank you. photo oh. 